Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Jack Resnick, President of the American Medical Association. On behalf of the AMA, I'm thrilled you've joined us for this session. We've assembled an impressive panel of physician leaders, medical experts, and the U.S. Surgeon General to talk about the real and intensifying crisis of physician burnout. We'll talk about some of the causes, needed solutions, and also the importance of addressing mental health. Although we hope the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic is now behind us, this has been a tough three years for our profession, and many drivers of burnout remain. The contours of this crisis are painfully clear. As the nation experiences a triple-demic this winter, with hospital beds filling again due to a mix of influenza, the RSV virus, COVID-19, and other respiratory illnesses, physicians continue to hold together a healthcare system stretched far too thin. Once cheered for this work, my physician colleagues now face anti-science aggression by some in positions of power and influence, along with a well-coordinated onslaught of medical disinformation from social media and other channels. At the same time, we're fighting efforts by some to interfere with decisions made between doctors and patients in our exam rooms. The recent criminalization of comprehensive reproductive health care in many states following the Dobbs decision has been accompanied by increasing hostility and threats directed at physicians and other medical workers. Demoralizing across-the-board Medicare payment cuts recently took effect just as practices are dealing with surging costs amid labor shortages and supply chain interruptions. Ever-growing administrative burdens including bloated prior authorization obstacles erected by health plans, force physicians to spend hours each week fighting to get treatments approved, while patient care is delayed and denied. Taken together, these factors create a toxic environment that hampers physicians' ability to do what drew us to medicine in the first place, deliver high-quality, compassionate care to our patients. Most of us haven't lost the will to do our jobs, but we're frustrated that our healthcare system just puts too many obstacles in our way. The result is physician burnout. It's real and it's rising. The most recent survey from the AMA, Mayo Clinic, and Stanford Medicine showed an alarming 63% of physicians experienced symptoms of burnout in 2021, up from 38% the previous year. One in every five physicians intends to leave practice within two years while one in three plan to cut back their hours. Doctors are tired. Seeing some of them wear down and leave the profession they dedicated their lives to really worries me. We're facing a shortage of up to 124,000 physicians by 2034. So this isn't just important for physicians. It's vital for patients and for the health of our nation. Organized medicine continues to give voice to these concerns and the solutions we need. The answer won't be found in telling physicians to be more resilient or set aside time for yoga or enjoy a free dinner with their hospital CEO, not by far. While wellness is important, focusing on physician resilience blames the victim. We need to fix what's broken, and it's not the doctor. While the AMA is partnering with practices and health systems to implement proven strategies and remove pain points that make caring for patients harder, we're also addressing the larger obstacles that drive burnout at the system level. That's the foundation for our recovery plan for America's physicians. Today, we'll talk about efforts to eradicate burnout and restore joy in medicine, and the larger systemic obstacles and unnecessary friction that frustrate physicians and interfere with high quality patient care. To guide us through what needs to be fixed is U.S. Surgeon General Vivek H. Murthy. As the nation's doctor, Dr. Murthy's mission is to help lay the foundation for a healthier country, relying on the best scientific information available to provide clear, consistent, and equitable guidance and resources for the public. Dr. Murthy serves as a key advisor to President Biden's pandemic response operation. Under President Obama, he created initiatives to tackle the nation's most significant health issues, including the Ebola and Zika viruses, the opioid crisis, and the growing threat of stress and loneliness to America's physical and mental well-being. He's the author of The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. 
Dr. Murthy is a leading advocate on the dangerous rise in health misinformation and the alarming rise in burnout in the health worker community. We've got a lot to talk about, so much that we've had to divide it into two sessions. So after you hear from the Surgeon General, stay tuned for additional perspectives from our panel. Welcome, Dr. Murthy. Thanks so much, Dr. Resnick. It's great to be here and have the chance to talk with you. And I want to begin with a, a rather somber point as we delve into this issue and, and the very real and negative consequences of physician burnout, and that's the tragedy of Lorna Breen. Uh, really as a devastating reminder of the backlash and consequences when physicians do reach out and, and seek mental health. How do we change the perception of physicians seeking mental health to make it less stigmatized and more clear that when people need it, it's, it's a resource that's available? Well, I'm so glad that we're talking about this because as you know so well, and as many of the physicians listening know well too, the crisis of burnout in our profession has been brewing for a long time. It was worsened by the pandemic, but preceded the pandemic. And stories like Dr. Breen's are just absolutely tragic uh, reminders that we have much more work to do to do right by people who are stepping up and entering this profession because they want to help and are finding often that it's too hard to do so and it shouldn't be that way. So how do we start to change that? Well, I, you know, I think we have to ask why it is so hard for people to step forward and get care right now. And yes, you can talk for a moment about the structural challenges there and actually accessing care. Many of our lower income health workers don't have access to insurance coverage either. There are real structural challenges. But there's a cultural issue here too, which is that from a stigma perspective, there's so many people in our profession who don't feel comfortable asking for help or getting help when it's available. To change that, we've got to do a few things. Number one, we have to lead by example. So leaders in medical societies, in hospitals, in clinics, and really across the board have to recognize that when they step up and utilize care, and when they do that publicly, it helps other clinicians see that it's okay uh, to do the same. When they talk about their stories and their struggles, it doesn't make them weak. It actually makes them human, and other people can see themselves in them. But the second thing we have to do is share more data so that people understand just how deeply uh, clinicians across the board are affected by mental health concerns. This is not the concern of 1% or 2%. Uh, the vast majority of clinicians at some point experience mental health struggles, whether it's depression or anxiety, and challenges with st managing stress or with handling the loneliness and isolation that sometimes can come with our work. I do believe that that data would be helpful for people to see. But third, there are changes we can make in policy that will actually help to address stigma. You think, for example, about the licensing process and how <clears throat> in surveys just a few years ago, 40% of physicians said that they hesitated to access mental health services because they worried that it would negatively affect their licensure. And so if you look, in fact, at the, you know, the state licensure applications and questionnaires, there are questions there that would make you scared, potentially, to be honest about the fact that you've had to seek care, whereas we should not be punishing people for seeking care uh, when they need it. And finally, let's just keep in, uh, this in mind, too. We all take cues from each other, right? And we're going, if, you know, if you're, even if you're not in a leadership position or you don't have a fancy title, it doesn't mean that you don't have influence. Uh, but when you reach out to a colleague, you ask them how they're doing. When you yourself reach out for help when you're struggling, it's not just good for you, but it's good for others. People see that, okay, this is something we can talk about. It's okay to ask for help. And it often feels good to give help too when asked. So these are all steps that we can all take collectively to help tear down that unfortunate shame and stigma which still deeply surround mental health in our profession. It's a great point you raised just around example setting and the power of others being able to see somebody step forward when they need help. And uh, also glad to hear your, your um, bringing up the licensure and credentialing. We've, we've seen some successes in some states recently about getting those questions off of uh, some of those applications so that people are just being asked about current impairment mm -hmm. and not something that maybe happened five years ago. So couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned studies showing that nearly 63% of physicians experience symptoms of burnout, and that, that was really just a soaring number from one that had been in the 30s just the year before. What do you think the first step or steps are to addressing this? Well, you know, burnout is a, is a deep multi-pronged issue, and it's not one issue, you know, sort of factor that's driven it. It's been multiple factors over many years. But with that said, I think we have to start by listening to clinicians and bringing them to the table to share their ideas about how we get past it. Uh, this isn't the kind of issue where we can you know, have a few people together in a small room determining 
what the strategy should be and then implementing it uh, for the entire profession. We have to have engagement and buy-in and the ide ideas uh, from people on the front lines. So that's got to be the first step. But there are other things we've got to do as well. You know, we've got to recognize that uh, there are too many burdens and not enough support when it comes to practicing medicine now. And how do we change that? Well, in terms of increasing support, uh, we can provide uh, the f more flexibility uh, to clinicians to be able to take care of many things they need to do in their life, getting medical care themselves, being there when a child is sick. Uh, when, it, when you can't do that for your family in particular, it adds an extraordinary amount of stress uh, to clinicians' lives. But the other way we can add support is by making mental health care more accessible. And this is not only about making sure that there's adequate insurance coverage, uh, both coverage itself and then adequate networks uh, to provide that coverage, but it's also about making sure that we have the, the flexibility to bring the care to where people are. You know, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that it significantly accelerated the use of telemedicine, particularly for mental health care. We've got to make sure that that does not go backward that the authorities for that are permanent, that the utilization continues to increase, but that we bring care to where our clinicians are, which is often at work. I remember talking during the, pen, the early days of the pandemic to a group of nurses from around the country who said, you know what, we actually have insurance coverage. We have providers in our network. Our problem is we're at the hospital all the time. And it's hard for us to just find time in the day uh, to go drive 30, 45 minutes and spend a few hours in a, in a clinician's office and then come back. But if you had a terminal here, where we can go into a private room and have a counseling session, we would love that. So we've got to make that those supports more accessible. That's on the support side. On the reduction of burden side, this gets to taking away the barriers that have cropped up and multiplied that stand between doctors and the patients you're seeking to care for. Um, you know, I, I haven't met a, a doctor across the country uh, who has said, you know, I really got into medicine because I wanted a chart. I wanted to spend time in front of a, a computer terminal. People got into this profession, like all of us did, you, me, all of us, because we wanted to spend time with patients. We wanted to understand them, hear their stories, help make diagnoses, walk them through treatments, and be a partner with them in the healing process. And so we've got to start removing these barriers. And one of the things which I know that, that you and the AMA have been wonderful partners on has been in ad addressing prior authorizations, uh, which this administration is very committed to doing, and CMS has put out multiple proposed rules now. Uh, to help address this very thorny issue of prior authorizations, which is adversely impacting efficiencies and the quality of care uh, that clinicians, that patients receive. And so we've got to start taking away some of these barriers. And, you know, some health systems have been doing a great job at trying to identify some of the seemingly small, uh, but as I think of them, noxious irritants uh, that actually cloud and, and, and color the, the doctor's experience. Uh, for example, the University of Hawaii Health System had a uh, their keep it simple, uh, you know, getting is getting rid of stupid stuff uh, program, um, their gross program, which uh, I loved because not only was it a good idea, but they were able to show the impact of that, which is that they saved thousands of hours of nursing time and saved time for clinicians as well. It's those types of engagements that can help us improve the quality of the experience uh, that clinicians and patients have, and when combined with increased supports. Um, we can do a lot, I think, to help address burnout. And lastly, I'll just say we can't start soon enough. You know, been, there's been good work that's been happening thanks to the leadership of organizations like the AMA and individual clinicians and communities and increasingly health systems and with many partners in government, including CMS, our office, and others. And that's all good, but we've got to do everything we can to accelerate that work because our, our health workforce is at risk. Our colleagues are, are struggling and they're suffering. And it's not only them uh, that are on the line, but it's the patients they care for uh, who they care for, whose health is now at risk and whose access uh, is at risk. So health worker burnout is not just a problem for health workers. This is a national priority, and it's one that deserves uh, our collective attention. And that's one of the reasons why uh, earlier last year, you know, we put out from my office as Surgeon General's advisory on health worker burnout to call our country's attention to how significant this crisis is and to lay out a pathway through which we can address it. Great. You mentioned telehealth. Uh, the administration's flexibilities at the be beginning of the pandemic were just transformative and really allowing us to seamlessly integrate that mode of care, I think, for our existing patients. It's been fantastic, and seeing Congress extend that has been great. Um, you mentioned prior auth. Uh, a huge thank you from the AMA. We're just in the process of really reviewing the details of those proposed new regulations, but I would say that physicians 
And patients, too, I think, are really heard. I hear their voices as I look at these regulations and think about um, what an enormous burden this has been for the profession, how much it affects patient care. And that's demoralizing, I think, for physicians to know that there are things getting in the way of actually providing that care that they're motivated to uh, to get for their patients. You know, I'm so glad that, that the AMA, that the administration and other partners have focused and really zeroed in on this because... You know, I've had, and all of us have had our own personal stories, uh, managing and grappling with and battling, really, prior authorizations. And there's, it's hard enough sometimes to make a diagnosis. It's hard enough to then actually get treatment for a patient. But to be denied the care, the often time-sensitive care that a patient needs um, because of a bureaucratic process that often feels like it's set up to inhibit care and uh, prevent expenditures rather than improve quality of care, that it hurts patients and doctors. Yeah. And even blow after blow, uh, when you're struck by that, like day after day, um, it's tough. It's, it's incredibly difficult not to lose faith sometimes in the system. So I think our work to address prior authorizations and other barriers, um, this is get, really aimed at getting back to what medicine really should be, which is an opportunity for clinicians to focus on doctoring, on providing the kind of care that patients need, which means spending time with them. And Every minute that a, a doctor is spending battling with an insurance company instead of listening to a patient and talking to them about their illness is a minute that's not well spent and everyone suffers. I couldn't say it better myself. Um, and yeah, I think when you and I were in, in training in years past, this prior auth was focused on a few brand new expensive drugs or procedures or tests. And I think our colleagues are now feeling it on even generic prescriptions sometimes that they write where they're ending up having to fight on the phone. So um, it's a huge issue, and, and I appreciate your shining a spotlight on it. You mentioned uh, the advisory that you put out, and I, I, I did really enjoy uh, reading it and, and uh, thought it was fantastic, appreciated your leadership in this area. The advisory, you, you dedicated it to the thousands of healthcare workers who lost their lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. You said they put their own health and safety at risk so they could heal and comfort others. The call to action is dedicated to their memory. You also in there drew specific attention to a lot of historically marginalized physicians and other healthcare workers who are disproportionately effective, affected. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the response you've seen to this so far and the impact that you think that the advisories had? Yeah, well, well, thank you for the kind words. And, and that was really, that advisory we issued on health worker burnout was really a labor of love. It was a personal uh, topic for many of us uh, who, and we have doctors and nurses and others in our profession, in our office who have been on the front lines. And we've seen how this has impacted our colleagues and, and all of us. And so this is very personal for us. And the truth is the dedication that we issued at the beginning to those who have lost their lives in our profession this is actually the kind of approach that clinicians have taken for years before the pandemic. How often is it that you've seen our colleagues put their safety you know, at risk because they knew that they needed to take care of somebody? How often have you seen them put their own personal lives on hold because they knew that a patient had an acute need that had to be, be met? How often have you seen them cancel plans uh, because a patient had a dire need in that moment? We've all seen that, and that's actually the DNA uh, of our clinicians and of our colleagues, we shouldn't abuse that as a society or take that for granted. Uh, we want, and we want to, we want to honor uh, that kind of instinct. We also want to make it sustainable. And um, for many people, it just isn't right now. I, I've been very grateful that the response to the advisory has been overwhelmingly positive. And interestingly, from many clinicians out there who who said, you know, they they just haven't felt seen and heard. They feel like they are being taken for granted, uh, that people assume that they will just always be there, even though they're dealing with more and more and more. But we've also uh, been excited about the partnerships that have been evolving since that came out, partnerships with health systems, which we are finding more and more stepping up to ask, what can we do to actually accelerate our work on well-being? Uh, we also have more and more partnerships within government as itself, including, for example, with CMS, where we're doing work around issues like prior authorizations. Um, but this is what we need to do more of, uh, because unless we work together, you know, collaboration with medical societies and with government and with health systems and EHR vendors and educational institutions, we won't get at all the factors that are driving burnout. And I think we also have to collectively speak as one voice to the public and help people know that, again, this is not a niche issue, but the issue of physician burnout stands to affect the health care of everyone in America. And that's why it has to be a national priority.
during the pandemic. I, I, in this role, I just get to see my physician colleagues around the country and what they're doing. And I think as they sort of ran towards the fire and put their lives on the line, uh, I just was filled with pride and, and what my physician and other healthcare worker colleagues were doing around the country. And we, we did sort of go from this place in the beginning where people were banging pots and pans and hollering and supporting physicians out their windows to after a while during the pandemic, physicians were, were more and more having to face this whole other threat of uh, disinformation and, and purposeful misinformation, whether patients were getting it through social media or, or other means. And I think it has been an additional burden in a way uh, on, on the profession and driven more burnout. You have thoughts about, about that? That's been heartbreaking to see. Uh, I really believe that the vast majority of members of our profession are heroes. They're there to sacrifice and to care for the people who, who come to them in need. And that's what they've done uh, admirably throughout this pandemic. But seeing that appreciation in, in some cases turn to indifference, in other cases turn to vitriol, uh, that's been incredibly painful. You know, 80% of health workers say that they sustained either physical or emotional attacks during the pandemic, 80%. And if you imagine going to a job where you think there's an 80% chance that you're going to be abused, I mean, who would want to come to work? Yet our colleagues continue to show up. Now, one thing that's important to ask is like, what's driving uh, that vitriol? And one of my deep worries is that we've had not only a polarized response, but a tremendous amount of misinformation uh, that has spread online, that has made people question uh, science, that has made them question validated data, that's made them question the scientists and clinicians that they typically entrust with their health. And look, people should ask questions. People, we should be rigorous about how it is that we come to make the recommendations that we make. But I think what we saw was something very different during the last couple of years, which is in some cases information being willfully spread. Um, in other cases, they were very well-intentioned people who were sharing misinformation because they couldn't tell the difference between what was true and what wasn't. And I need to really address that uh, misinformation. Uh, you know, we've got to do a few things. And this, by the way, needs to be a priority because I, when I look at the the future, and I think about what are the great threats that we have uh, to, to our health. Health misinformation really stands out as one of those, because we can have the best science, we can have the best clinicians in the world, but if people don't believe uh, that illnesses are real, if they don't believe that the treatment's proven to work can help them, they will not seek out that care. And sadly, we are seeing that in some cases play out right now with COVID vaccination and even with treatments. So what do we have to do about it? Well, as a, there's a lot we have to do as a society, and I think everyone has a role, but specifically as a prof medical profession, I think number one, we have to recognize that we still are among the most, one of the most trusted professions in the country. And the question is, what are we gonna do with that trust? How do we utilize this moment to speak with people and listen to what their concerns are? Because sometimes people have legitimate concerns, and I think when we swat them away, when we make them feel like they're perhaps not intelligent uh, you know, or gullible for believing misinformation, uh, they tune out and understandably so. So we've got to, number one, uh, listen to people and understand why they believe what they believe. I think the second thing that we have to do is we have to ensure that we have a bigger voice in the public square, right? Right now, our voices are often limited to the exam room. But out there, I know for a fact that people in communities want to hear uh, from the clinicians in their community. Uh, there are so many moments in the last couple of years where schools, at school town halls, uh, it was parents who were doctors who actually stepped into those meetings to actually try to explain to people what science was telling us about COVID-19. Uh, the same is true in faith gatherings, you know, where at churches and synagogues and mosques, when congregations were confused, it was a doctor from the community uh, at times who was able to step in and provide uh, some information that was trust, uh, you know, trustworthy and reliable. We have to do more of that. We can't cede the public square uh, to people who don't necessarily have uh, the qualifications to assess data or don't have experience caring for patients. Uh, everyone can have a voice, but we should have more of a voice for those who are truly experts. Um, the third thing that we've got to do, though, is also make sure that we are advocating for and supporting efforts uh, to ensure that the people across the country have greater health literacy, right? Being health literate is not a simple thing, right? It is hard for even those with a college degree and of like a PhD to even sometimes understand uh, what science tells us, right? These are very difficult things. And it's also hard for sometimes even doctors to know what the difference is between information and misinformation when they see it online, right? So this is not about intelligence. This is about training 
us to be able to distinguish what's true and not true in a rapidly evolving information environment. And we haven't really kept up with that. We haven't helped guide people in how to uh, approach health literacy. But that's something we should be doing from the youngest of ages because uh, it's a vital tool uh, for survival right now. So these are a few things that we can and should be doing. But one last thing I would offer, which is that if we want to, I think, be as thoughtful about this as possible, I think we have to be honest about what worked and didn't work in the public dialogue during COVID-19. And there, for many of us who are familiar with the scientific process, we're used to de debate and discussion and information and tr from trials evolving over time and sometimes conclusions shifting as the data shifts. But that was not a very familiar process to a lot of people on the outside who looked at that and said, why am I being told one thing today and now, you know, another thing, you know, tomorrow? Like, why, are, why do things keep changing? And I think part of what we have to do also is do a better job of bringing members of the scientific community together to be able to discuss different points of view, but then come out with a general, uh, if not a consensus, you know, a majority opinion about where things stand. And some of the questions we have to discuss is, who's at those tables? How do we make sure that the tent is big enough to make sure different points of view are, are, are represented? How do we make sure that minority opinions don't get suppressed or squeezed out? Because sometimes there's something really valuable there that we need to hear. So how we create and model, I think, a big tent where we can listen, where we can evaluate, but then where we can come forward with thoughtful scientific conclusions is something I think we can do a better job of uh, as a profession. So, and if we do that publicly, I think it will help members of the community who want to know, what should I do for my health and for the health of my family? Your points about uh, health literacy are important, and I think it even goes back to science education in elementary and, and secondary education, so people actually understand the scientific process. And then, you're right, we have a, an important role to play in uh, bringing more people into those into those tents and thinking about how, how we communicate. Um, I'm thinking about the sort of anti-science aggression and how hard that has been on the profession, and then on top of it at the same time, we have states and legislators trying to sort of insert themselves in exam rooms in different places around the country and sort of interfere with that important doctor-patient relationship where we really do uh, a lot of shared decision making. And it really is about sharing our expertise and then meeting the patient where they are with, with their expectations and values. But whether it's reproductive health care or gender affirming care, we're seeing doctors also have to worry about sort of having state legislators or others sitting on their shoulder in the exam room. Do you think that's added to, to the burdens? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I, when you go to medical school, as you and I did and our colleagues did, and you're learning medicine, you're learning how to take data, how to make sure you use it to help a patient, how to understand their psychology, how to support them. What you're not learning about is how to contend with the intrusion uh, of, of government or other entities in the relationship you have with your, with your patient. And I think that has added uh, fear and undue stress uh, to a relationship that's already been challenged uh, between doctors and patients by all the other intrusions and burdens uh, that have been layered on top of it. So I do think this is a big challenge. I think what's important for all of us to recognize, and this should not be political, it should not be um, you know, partisan issue, is when we support doctors and patients in working together to come up with the best decisions for patients, that everyone generally does do better because we have, this is I think where we have to come at it with humility. We, none of us can recognize the full complexity uh, at play when a patient is making decisions for their health. We do not know the interplay between their socioeconomic factors, their faith, their values, uh, their past experiences. Uh, all of these things come together to help inform a very complex, nuanced decision. And we can't paint that with a single brush. And, any, and whenever we try to do that, I think we ultimately contribute to harm. And that's why I think we have to trust that patients and their clinicians can make these decisions uh, together. And we should be supporting them in that process. And when we don't, I just think we make the, li the lives and the work uh, of clinicians harder, and we make better health outcomes more difficult. I think it's that complexity that drew us and probably most of our colleagues who are watching today to medical school in the first place. We wouldn't do these jobs if they were, if they were easy and simple. And that's one of the reasons that when I think about legislators trying to lock medical decision-making into statute, that it just doesn't make sense because these decisions are really, are really complex. Uh, I'm going to give give you one more question and then let you uh, offer some concluding comments. And we've also talked about the triple-demic a little mm -hmm. bit that we're witnessing right now. And in your own work, you've really led the national response to Ebola and to Zika, and you're a key advisor to Biden's pandemic response operation. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between 
stress and mental health and loneliness and physician burnout, and in particular, the unique type of burnout that physicians experience during a period of history like this when we're in the midst of, of the COVID pandemic? Yeah, you know, you stress is something that is certainly no stranger uh, to members of our, of our profession from the earliest of ages, right? Like we, stress is almost in part of our training, part of our education process, part of our work lives. Um, but there's good stress and there's bad stress, right? And when we go to the gym, for example, we stress our muscles. And if we stress them in a good way, uh, where we put on an adequate load, uh, that's not too much, uh, not too little, and where we give ourselves adequate time for rest in between, then we get stronger, we get healthier. But imagine if I lifted, you know, a barbell that was way too heavy for me and I held that position for 30 minutes, probably do some damage, you know, and we know this from times where many of us may have been injured in the gym uh, from improper lifting techniques. You know, I certainly have done that, <laughs> I will admit. Um, so there's a right way to stress our bodies and a wrong way to stress our bodies. And this applies to emotional stress as well. Um, you know, we certainly can contend with stress, but there are a few things that make it harder for us to do so. One is when the absolute load is way too high, and others when the duration of stress is prolonged. And the third is when we're dealing with concomitant loneliness and isolation. Because it turns out that loneliness is a natural, I mean, uh, social connection rather, is a natural buffer for stress, right? Like think about it, a lot of times when we are stressed, when most people are stressed, one of the things they do is they reach out to a friend, get in the car and drive over to see, uh, you know, a family member. They do something that connects them with somebody they have a safe relationship with, because that helps uh, to relieve our stress. But when we are further isolated in our work, because we have, you know, long work hours or, or odd work hours, right, where we're not, you know, syncing with other people's social schedules, um, when we start to feel just more and more weighed down by our work and don't want, don't feel like we can share that burden uh, with others, um, when we become more lonely and isolated, that actually worsens the impact of stress. And that's one of the reasons why as we think about how to deal with stress, not only do we need to deal with the structural factors, not only do we need to uh, address the stigma that prevents people from getting care, but we have to think about how to build social connection and community in our lives, as well as within the house of medicine. Like I'll tell you that one of, when I was in residency training, um, it was not easy by any uh, you know, stretch of the imagination. The hours were tough, the type of work was hard, we were dealing with emotionally laden issues. But I actually loved my time in residency for one primary reason. Uh, for many, but for one that uh, rises to the top, and that was the people that I worked with. Uh, we had a real sense of connection. I felt like I was coming to work with friends every day uh, when I came to work. If I was worried about screwing up, I knew that there were other people who would help me, you know, not make a mistake, who would support me, who would make me feel ashamed uh, or embarrassed. Uh, that made all the difference in the world. Um, but I know that after you finish training, for many clinicians, it becomes very lonely. You don't necessarily have that built-in community. People separate and go off into their, their lives, get occupied with other things, and we don't invest in building those bonds. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to. So as we think about addressing stress, like I want us certainly to think about you know, access to care and the structural factors driving uh, stress, but I think that the social connections that we foster, they're not just nice to have, but they're absolutely necessary if we want to make it through what are extraordinarily difficult days and, and a job that's incredibly important uh, but that also can be very, very stressful. You know, I know today we, we talked about a lot of uh, topics that are challenges for the profession. And, you know, for anyone who's considering going into medicine or if you're, uh, you've got a child who's thinking about going to medicine or a friend who's thinking about going to medicine, I know as a thought may pop up into your head, like, is this really the right recommendation to make that they actually pursue a career in medicine? And I just want to advocate in this moment that the reason, that the answer is absolutely yes. This is an extraordinary profession to be a part of, despite all the thorns uh, that we've spoken about, all the challenges that exist. There are a few lines of work where you get to be a part of a patient's life in as intimate a way uh, as we get to be. Uh, there are a few opportunities that people have to be able to help and intervene at a time of crisis and provide comfort and care when a person and their family most need it. Um, we are so incredibly blessed to be able to do this work, uh, and this work is needed. Uh, and so, yes, there are changes we have to make. Yes, there are reforms that we have to fight for. Um, yes, there are colleagues that we've got to support. But we need good people in medicine. This is still an incredibly fulfilling uh, profession, and it is so deeply needed. So I would just encourage folks out there who have you know, encountered uh, students or others who are thinking about whether to go into this profession 
to urge them to do so. And for all of those who have made that leap, whether it was a couple of years ago or a few decades ago, uh, to become a healer, I just want to say thank you for enduring the challenges that, you know, that you've been through for enduring the, the struggles, you know, that we're going through as a profession and for sticking with it. Because the truth is people need good clinicians who are knowledgeable, who are thoughtful, who are empathic and kind. Um, and, you know, I think we can get to a better place in terms of the quality of practice of medicine, but we, we need good people in the profession. And, uh, I would certainly encourage all those who are interested to join, uh, join up. Well, what a, what a wonderful note to end on. I feel the same way. It's, uh, what we get to do is such a privilege and to get to, uh, I mean, I love the, the policy work that I do and getting to come to Washington, but I, I still am a practicing physician and, uh, to get to go back and sit in an exam room and be face to face with a patient and actually have them share their problems and challenges and concerns with you and work together towards a solution. There, there's, there's nothing else like it. So I, I really couldn't agree more. And I think it's, it's really what motivates, I know my work and I'm sure your work and the public health services work and, and the administration's work as well to make sure we leave behind a profession for the next generation that continues to be joyous. And that's why we, we do this work to fight burnout and, uh, and get those obstacles out of the way. So thank you, Surgeon General, so much for your time, for your leadership and using your platform to draw attention to this really important topic. To our audience, thank you for joining us. The conversation is really far from over. Please stay tuned for the second half of this discussion where we're going to be joined by our panel of experts. Thanks again. Thanks so much. We're back. Thank you again to U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Murthy for his leadership and his insight in that last fantastic session. Now we're going to gather ideas, recommendations, and propose solutions related to burnout and mental health from our panel of physician leaders and medical experts. We'll talk about what wellness looks like in the healthcare space and what we must do to move closer to it. Joining us are three physician leaders with significant experience in recognizing and solving physician burnout at the individual and system levels. It's my pleasure to introduce Anjali Gallion. Dr. Gallion is a pediatric neurologist, physician wellness officer, and president-elect of the medical staff at Children's Hospital of Orange County in California. She has a passion for wellness initiatives with a focus on system-wide operational solutions. She's a noted researcher through the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke and a consistent advocate for policies that support health and wellness. Welcome, Dr. Gallion. Thanks for having me. We're also delighted to have Christine Sinsky, MD, with us today. Dr. Sinsky is a board-certified internist and the AMA's Vice President for Professional Satisfaction. She's the author of The Quadruple Aim, Joy in Practice, texting while doctoring, and creating a manageable cockpit, contributions that continue to lead our national conversation on wholeness, wellness, and how physicians might achieve and maintain both. Welcome, Dr. Sinsky. Thanks, Jack. Glad to be here. Rounding out our panel is Nigel Geergra, and Dr. Geergra is Chief Wellness Officer and Medical Director of Liver Transplantation at Ochsner Health System in New Orleans. He's a recognized thought leader in workforce well-being with a degree in managing healthcare delivery from Harvard Business School. Ochsner Health System is the recipient of a $2.9 million grant to address workforce, mental health, and burnout. Welcome, Nigel. Great to be here, Jack, and joining you all. It's wonderful, wonderful to have all three of you with us today, and we've got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in with some questions, if that's okay. Anjali, let me, let me start with you. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of sleep and the impact of sleep deprivation based on your own research? Thanks, Jack. Um, our knowledge about sleep and really the impacts of sleep deprivation have really, really increased in the last 30 to 40 years. The main the main concept is that your brain is actually doing very important work during sleep, and they're not just a bunch of hours from which you can steal to kind of do other stuff. A nice study in JAMA a couple years ago looked at hundreds of physicians, and what they found was that one in three physicians screened were actually positive for a sleep disturbance. Even more interesting was that those who are positive for a sleep disturbance had higher rates of burnout and less professional fulfillment. Advances in sleep actually help us to understand the why. 
There's kind of two main concepts I wanted to bring up. And the first is the idea of connections. When you're awake, your brain is making all these connections. It gets stimulation, it's getting all this input, and the brain cells are actually connecting. In sleep, we have now understood that the brain is actually getting rid of the connections that you don't need and helping strengthen the one that you do. This makes sense. A lot of us remember in college, they said, don't pull the all-nighter. It's better to go to sleep and then wake up in the morning and study. We have better executive function, better cognitive performance when we've had good sleep. The second is the idea of how sleep is related to chronic health conditions. A lot of people know that things like sleep apnea is related to cardiovascular stress, but the brain actually has important physiology that happens in sleep, even without pathology. The brain actually activates an entire filtration system, the glymphatic system, during deep sleep. The glymphatic system filters out harmful things like beta amyloid, which gets deposited in high amounts for people who have things like Alzheimer's. Really, to me, this is about that broader concept of the toll of constantly being on call for the hospital, our patients, and those ever-present dings and pings and texts. Our brain isn't really getting the time to disconnect and do other work that it needs to do so we can perform optimally. We increasingly see athletes, high-performing people recognizing the importance of good sleep, and it's important that we take that same lens for our physicians not just for our health and wellness, and really to support our workforce, to put really to provide great, safe patient care. Angela, now I'm just worried about the damage that's already been done with my own sleep deprivation, <laughs> but uh, really important points. Thank you. Thank you. I think as we design workflows of the future, this is, is really going to be important. Uh, Chris, I want to turn to you for a second. And you know, a lot of the early work in physician wellness was focused on individual resilience. And it always felt to me a bit like that was sort of blaming the victim. In a recent interview, you you said something like, it's important for us to realize that while burnout manifests in individuals, it originates in systems. Can you elaborate a little bit on these ideas and, and how you think they fit into the discussion? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think we know that anytime the majority of a group experiences something, then it has to be related to something other than individual weakness. And so we know now that 63% of physicians are currently experiencing some sign of burnout, and that can't possibly be related to uh, individual weakness on the part of physicians. And in fact, we know from a study we published in 2020 that physicians as a group have a significantly higher level of resilience than the general population. We are a highly resilient profession. And so I think rather than focusing on fixing the worker, we need to focus on fixing the workplace. And just as Dr. Gallion was saying, some of this manifests in individuals in the sleep disturbance, which then can uh, contribute to burnout, but it's related to the system in which we are working, to all those pings, to all that call. And, and so I think the work we need to do is to build better teamwork, better technology, better workflows, continue to work to reduce the administrative burden and that's all happening in the work environment rather than trying to fix the individual worker with yoga and mindfulness and meditation. As helpful as those things may be, that's not where we should start because it's the environment, the system that's broken, not the people within. Great points. Thanks. Nigel, I want to talk a little bit about the four-pronged approach to mental health that, that you've talked about. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to those four elements and what changes you've really observed based on successes with that approach? Sure, uh, Jack. I, I think an approach to mental health or, um, for that matter, any organizational imperative uh, should be based on data, uh, qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, married with a little bit of intuition. So um, in our case at Oshner, our uh, quantitative data, um, we looked at surveys, both engagements and the AMA um, well-being index, we're able to measure burnout, uh, drivers of burnout, um, the state of mental health, um, both depression and PTSD, and also barriers or perceived barriers to seeking mental health support. 
Um, another data point was we were seeing actually in the first year of the pandemic, our EAP utilization going down, which was a little perplexing. Um, but I think, you know, qualitative data can be uh, more important. So by this, I mean the comments on the surveys. Um, what I was hearing when rounding on the hardest hit units uh, during the, the waves of the pandemic, uh, comments from focus groups and open forums and, um, you know, sort of distilling this down to a voice of the customer. Overall, you know, I was hearing that while an EAP program is great, folks wanted to, to get a little bit more upstream, uh, sort of proactive versus reactive, uh, a little bit more on demand. So very briefly, our four prongs are, um, first part would be just simply educating folks and raising awareness. Um, secondly, measuring mental health, as I, as I discussed earlier. Um, thirdly, uh, destigmatizing or normalizing the conversation uh, in a few ways, but mainly through changing leadership, behavioral norms and communication norms. And then lastly, um, experimenting with different uh, support offerings and, and looking at things like utilization, net promoter score, uh, scores with those offerings and sc scaling those things that seem to be working and sundowning those that aren't. And, and in terms of what I've observed, you know, compared to 2019, um, mental health and well-being uh, is just uh, much more part of our culture, our fabric. Um, we're seeing this, Jack, with our, you know, our executive communications, uh, how our department meetings are run, one-on-one um, -on -one check-ins. Uh, we even have a uh, mental health affinity group or resource group. That would have been the case in 2019. And um, it just seems like people, both frontline clinicians and leaders are reaching out for help more here at Oshman. Nigel, I'm glad you mentioned leadership because I think we've seen in a lot of the data and in our AMA work with health systems that that is just such an enormous predictor of, of levels of burnout, the true level of engagement of, of leadership within a system so, or practice. So glad to hear that. Um, Angela, I'd love to come back to you and, and sleep medicine for a second and maybe even bring in a little bit of, of digital health, which I know you've, you've thought about as well, and the role of advancements in those spaces to reduce physician burnout. I think we all recognize that technology has had such an amazing effect on our lives, but as a society, we're still trying to find that balance of, of the benefits and the consequences. The pandemic really jump-started that with telehealth and all these new ways for us to be connecting with patients' families. But what we also see that for physicians, it's not just about that connection, but that feeling of being responsible all the time that can really perpetuate some of the burnout. Just again, to Nigel's point, I think organizations like the AMA are doing a really good job of helping us build awareness, but also understanding of what goes into it. I wanna recognize systems like my own at the Children's Hospital of Orange County, where they're actually using existing digital platforms to help understand this. So with our email system, things like Outlook and the Microsoft Calendar, they actually track how much meeting burden is, how many administrative tasks we have. And we get information about how much people are on email, how quickly they're responding or feel that they need to respond. It's really powerful data in your own email system to see how many people are doing tasks after 8 p.m. and sometimes after midnight. The other thing is that the electronic health record has had so many benefits for our patients, documentation, clear orders, standardized order sets. But what if we used it in a different way? What if we thought about the EHR as a tool to look at physician burnout? Our healthcare system is one that's actually trying to do that seeing how many clicks does it take you to get through a patient chart? How much time are people spending charting after hours or you know, efficiently? What is really interesting is that if we think about the existing digital platforms as not just tools to help the patients, but as a mirror to see what's going on in our own organization, it's really powerful. The other thing it does is it allows us to use existing measures to see if interventions make sense. I loved Christine's point that asking physicians to do more yoga is not the answer. But if a system is gonna change, we have to have measurable ways to see that the intervention makes a difference. And so can we use existing technology 
to do that. Again, we've recognized how this is important for trainees, but I wonder what it would be like if hospitals said, if you're not on call, maybe you don't need access to the EHR. Maybe you shouldn't be expected to do extra things. Would it actually shift our expectation of what can actually be done in a workday if the workday wasn't 24 hours? So leveraging existing technology, I think, can be a powerful tool, and we don't always have to look for something new. Helping us understand the scope and breadth of this issue and how to make a difference can be really powerful. So glad to hear about leveraging all these data that we actually do have and these tools that we're being using that we're using. You have an example maybe of so once you found out that a certain subset of physicians are spending a lot of time at 11 o'clock at night. We even hear from our patients sometimes, can't believe you're answering my message at 11 p.m. Um, an intervention that in response to those data, a health system can undertake. So one of the things is when you engage your leadership and you change the expectation of response time, the Microsoft system will actually say, hey, do you need to send this email now? Why don't you wait until business hours? There's also this idea of just highlighting what's going on. So we verbally recognize and acknowledge you don't have to respond 24 hours a day. You don't need to on Saturday night at 1 p.m. be doing all of this. And so these ideas of engaging leadership and then having gentle prompts, which don't feel too onerous to say, hey, do we really need to do this now can be really helpful for the system. Chris, I've heard you uh, cite some data in the past around specific costs to the healthcare system of burnout. And I know that when we talk to health systems, um, we often utilize these data if, if they need a bit of a wake up call as to how big of a problem this is. And I, I've heard the number 4.6 billion just based on the turnover and reduced hours that, that occur due to burnout, not even including many of the other costs. Can you say a bit about how the AMA is responding to this crisis, how it's maybe different than some other things that we've faced as an organization? Sure, sure. Happy to do that. So first, I think we're raising awareness about how costly burnout is to various stakeholders. So it does cost us at the tip of the iceberg as a health system, $4.6 billion a year. Individual health systems also bear a cost. If you're a system that has a thousand physicians and average rates of burnout, you are already investing over $13 million every single year, just replacing those physicians who leave your organization, not for a better job, not for a career advancement, but who leave just because of burnout. And so our message is invest a fraction of that upstream on the activities that will reduce burnout and you'll have a positive ROI. And many of the things, Angeli, that you were talking about, all that work outside of work or pajama time that's happening at night is driving burnout. We know that if you've got um, higher rates of work outside of work, you have much higher rates of, of burnout than if you are in the lower quintile of, of work outside of work. So we've been doing a lot. The AMA has invested many millions of dollars every year on removing obstacles from the physician in their care of patients and reducing burnout. So we do research. We sponsor eight to 10 research projects every year that are using EHR audit log data, all that data that's already being collected and looking at things like time on inbox and how does that relate to burnout and how can we reduce time on inbox with greater teamwork. We're looking, we help organizations measure uh, both the rates of burnout in their organization and the precursors of that burnout and the consequences. So we have what's called an organizational assessment, our organizational biopsy. And Nigel, your group was our um, initial group to do that in a pilot fashion. And uh, we now have national benchmarks and we do that at no cost to organizations. So they can have a better sense of what's happening and use local data to communicate among the leadership about the issue at hand. We have a recognition program where we recognize organizations that are really doing exceptionally well in terms of addressing health professional well-being. And this also serves as a roadmap. So organizations who are at the beginning of their journey and are saying, 
you know, I know we've got a problem, but we really don't know where to start. We don't know what to do. Have been using this recognition program and the criteria and using that as a strategic roadmap as they map out the next three to five years of their efforts to reduce burnout. We have a, an enormous wealth of resources in what we call our Steps Forward Academy. We have um, had over 1.8 million unique users of our Steps Forward toolkits. We have webinars, we have podcasts. Thank you, Dr. Gergraf, for being a frequent podcaster with us yeah. on that. Um, <laughs> One of the things that's part of our Steps Forward is a de-implementation checklist. So it's a guide that organizations can use to look through and see, are there opportunities for us to remove policies that at one point made sense, but are no longer necessary or relevant? And we sent that checklist to the Joint Commission, who reviewed it, made a few comments, and we edited it accordingly. And so we now know that this is um, aligned with the Joint Commission standards, which means it's also aligned with CMS requirements. One organization, um, Kaiser of Southern California, had looked at that list and saw that one of the things we uh, recommend is to remove unnecessary password burdens. And so they looked it over and decided they no longer needed to require password revalidation at the time of putting in an order. And so they turned that off. That provided relief for 1.5 billion, with a B, orders every week in their system. And other systems have done that as well and talk about the relief that just really, um, rises up from within their organization by removing that really frequent pebble in the shoe. And then uh, just as another example, we have an inbox reduction checklist uh, that is will be published in the next uh, few months uh, that is available now um, uh, in, individually, but it goes through some of the things that other organizations have done to reduce the volume of inbox work, which is what is causing physicians to spend hours every day after hours. And really, physicians aren't leaving their jobs. They are leaving their inboxes when they choose to leave their clinical position. So I think we're really fortunate that the AMA has invested a lot of resources to help address these issues. And I'm optimistic because there's so much good that can be done. Chris, the term de-implementation checklist just brings a smile to my face every time <laughs> I hear it. And I think about some of the the wasteful things that we've all built into our systems that we can take back away, particularly as we keep adding new things. I've also really been uh, pleased with your group's work and the rest of AMA's work around, as we take this from the individual level up to the system level, and we think both about all these great examples you've given about helping practices and healthcare systems to reduce friction and take some of those burdens away, but also as our advocacy team and the rest of the organization thinks about trying to take some of those burdens down at the big health system, insurer, government level, like prior off and all those other things that uh, have grown out of control that actually contribute to this. So keep up the good work. Nigel, you wrote a letter to 34,000 coworkers um, sharing some personal reflections on self-care and mental health. And I'd, I'd love it if you could share with our audience today a little bit about that and about the reflection or reaction that, that you heard from your colleagues. Yeah, uh, happy to. Um, so I, uh, like many of us, uh, was really uh, struggling in the summer of 2020, the first year of the pandemic. Um, summer is often a tough time for me. Uh, it represents the anniversary many years ago of my son Bennett, and then uh, his death the following year. Um, usually I'm able to uh, recognize the symptoms and compensate uh, I'm usually able to plan a, plan a vacation up to Canada uh, to spend time with family and friends, uh, you know, visit the grave. Um, exercise is important. That summer I ruptured my quadricep tendon and had surgery, so I wasn't exercising. And things just seemed to be um, kind of getting worse. Um, I called it languishing, but uh, it's probably a euphemism. Uh, you know, I think I was anxious and depressed. Um, so I eventually reached out for help and certainly got on the right track quickly. Um, 
And I guess uh, an epiphany uh, of sorts for me was that many of us, if not all of us, uh, have some version of that story, um, but are kind of timid um, to reach out for help, essentially because of the stigma ar around the conversation, particularly in healthcare. Um, so in September of 2020, uh, I composed uh, an open letter. Um, I have a quarterly open letter, but my previous ones would be kind of sterile, sort of report out some of what we were doing. And this one, I told the story, I told that story um, that I just shared with you. And then I talked more broadly about the, uh, what I thought was, uh, you know, the stigma that exists uh, around mental health and in healthcare. But this part was kind of talked about intuition and data. This was all intuition. Um, I, you know, I'd run it by a few executives and they were supportive, but uh, I was extremely nervous sending that out. <laughs> Uh, but um, it was pretty uh, overwhelming. So most executive letters that go out or executive emails may get elicit two or four responses. Um, I had hundreds uh, of people reach out um, sharing their stories. Uh, some of it, some of them calling it a call for action to to seek help. So, you know, I. I, I think I, I talked earlier about changing um, leadership, you know, communication norms, and I, I, I think, um, I think, you know, it's sort of a, a fairly important step within our organization. I, yeah, um, you know, and I, I've seen many communications by other executives, not just at this organization. Uh, I'm not saying that <laughs> my letter was the reason for that cause and effect, but I think. Um, executive emails have gotten a little more conversational, a little more personal, uh, rather than just sort of data report outs, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for uh, being vulnerable and willing to share that. I just, as we have seen so many physicians due to stigma not get the help that they need uh, when they are in crisis, I think we just can't say enough about the power of having a respected senior colleague um, share their own stories as as we work to destigmatize that. So I really appreciate that. Chris, how how do we get back to this work? At the end of the day, um, you know, we want to reduce burnout um, because it gets in the way of doing what brought us all to medicine in the first place, that love of actually providing care to our patients. Um, how do we shift the framework and and get back to that? Right, right. Well, first of all, I, I just want to underline what Nigel just said because I think leadership modeling, um, getting help, avoiding the iron dock uh, stereotype um, is really important. And it's a way of being human and, and a way of having relationships. Uh, you were human and developed a relationship with the other people within your organization by sharing that that letter. And, and so how do we get back to doing the work that really matters? I think there are a couple key concepts. One of it, those, is that we have evolved to a very transactional notion of what healthcare is. And yet I believe at its core, our work is relational. And when we build the infrastructures and the processes within our organization, and we support that with the policies and the physical space and the technology that supports relationships with our patients and supports relationships with each other, we will have better outcomes. And I think stepping back again, um, over the last several decades, when the EHR was implemented, I noticed that there was this great work transfer, that work that previously was done by receptionists, pharmacists, medical records, clerks, by transcriptionists, suddenly became the work responsibility of the physician. And because of that iron dock mentality, and because you know we always step up to the plate and take on what needs to be done, we kept taking on and kept taking on until it started to break us. And I think it's come to the breaking point when we have two hours of EHR and desk work for every one hour of direct FaceTime uh, with our patients. 
And I think what's happened is we recognize that we are spending our days doing the wrong work for our patients. We are spending our days doing transactional activities and we are not doing the healing work of deep thinking, the deep work of doctoring and of strengthening the relationships. So there's a framework that I came upon that I think has really been helpful in my own thinking, and I hope it's helpful for others. And it comes from the Harvard Business School and Clay Christensen, who had uh, been at the Harvard Business School. And it's the idea of solution shop versus production line work. That in most industries, the highest trained professional their time is reserved for solution shop work, which is meant the solving of unstructured problems. And I'd modify that in healthcare to mean the solving of unstructured problems and the development of relationships. And production line work can also be very important, but that's more the standardized predictable work of the practice. Some of that work that previously was done by the receptionist and the transcriptionist and the medical records clerk that got pushed to the physician. And I think we need to start looking at work distribution and saying, are we making the best use of the training, the investment that society has made in physicians by having our physicians work as transcriptionists? by having our physicians do every order entry, by having our physicians spend more time on data processing than knowledge work, than adding value to the knowledge. And so for me, that thought about looking at solution shop versus production line work, and have we thoughtfully distributed that work according to training and ability um, is really helpful and gets at one of the core problems, again, that our physicians are spending our, we know we're just spending our days doing the wrong work for our patients. We're not available to see them on the same day they need to be seen. We can't focus on the three things that they brought to us because we're so busy typing the note and going through the drop down boxes to enter the orders and all of those things that, uh, and doing the prior auth, all of those things that take us away from the core meaningful work of healthcare. I think that's really going to resonate with our audience because it's, it aligns so closely with what I hear from physicians and their frustrations about, and I think the electronic health record has made it easier for a lot of those tasks to roll uphill to the physician um, and away from others in the practice, and it doesn't have to be that way. So uh, thank you for, for giving voice to that. We're nearly out of time, but I wanted to open it up a little bit or anybody have anything that they think is missing from this discussion or things we need to pay attention to in the next phase of this work and then in the next several years um, that have not really made the priority list yet. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what Chris said, it, um, at least at Oshner, it seems like a, a bit like back to the future. Obviously, in the last two years, two and a half years, we spent a lot of in time doing important work around resilience um, and mental health. But, uh, you know, in the, the surveys that we're conducting now, you know, I'm hearing loud and clear, <laughs> get back to blocking and tackling, um, practice efficiency, uh, advanced team-based care, automation, leadership development. So these were areas of focus pre-pandemic. I think we got a little distracted uh, for good reason during the pandemic, but I think we have to, um, certainly reboot those efforts um, around those those areas. Well, seeing the burnout numbers soaring and the data of the last couple of years during the pandemic, knowing what our colleagues have been through as they took care of this country over these last three difficult years, piling, fighting disinformation and misinformation on top of, of all these other burdens that we've been talking about, I think it's not surprising. And I think we have a workforce that's somewhat tired, but wants to find ways um, to, to fall in love with their work again and to experience the joy of medicine. So I'm just so appreciative of the work that the three of you are doing. You're bringing data to the work. You're bringing inspiration to the work. And I want to extend my gratitude to each of our panelists, to the U.S. Surgeon General for contributing to this really important session. And to the members of our virtual audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you for participating. 
On behalf of the American Medical Association, we look forward to continuing our discussions around the most important issues of healthcare. So thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.